and welcome back. Our first conversation, as we mentioned earlier, is with the Minister of Home Affairs and New Growth Industries. We have with us in studio this morning, the Honorable Karim Musa. Good morning, Minister. Good morning, Isani, and good morning, Marlene. Thanks for having me on today. You're welcome. Our primary conversation this morning surrounds the cannabis industry and the legislation and the framework that is to be put in place um, to be able to get this particular industry off the ground. Um, let's begin with the most recent developments in terms of the bill, what it encompasses, and perhaps who the affected parties, I say affected parties, more, mainly the stakeholders at various levels. What yeah. does this entail? Well, as you would recall, um, Isani, last year, October, uh, we had introduced uh, in the House of Representatives amendments to the Misuse of Drugs Act. Mm -hmm. And this is following the very same uh, trajectory as the previous administration in 2017, when they had made amendments to the Misuse of Drugs Act to allow for industrial hemp, mm -hmm. if you would recall. Um, from which there were uh, an issuance of about 36 or so licenses for industrial hemp. Mm -hmm. um, of that 36, only about two or three have actually gotten off the ground producing industrial hemp. Mm -hmm. Now, fast forward to last year, uh, October 2021, where we introduced a subsequent amendment to the Misuse of Drugs Act. Um, again, the reason for that is that uh, cannabis is controlled and regulated under that particular act, along with all other drugs. So it is not that we are legalizing marijuana, and I think that is a common misconception out mm -hmm. there. What we are actually legalizing is the cannabis industry. Um, and so when that went to the House of Representatives last October, um, it enjoyed good support from the opposition. Uh, in particular, the current leader of the opposition supported it, as well as the Honorable Tracy Tager Panton supported it. And I think one other from the opposition. But it, it passed through the House of Representatives. And when it got to the Senate, there were concerns that were raised. Um, and one of the particular concerns raised by the social partner senators was that they felt that this was such uh, a big industry, so to speak, mm -hmm. that it should not be contained or limited under a Misuse of Drugs Act, but rather it should have an act on its own. Um, hence the reason we uh, went back to the drawing table. And I, th and I think that's important, you know, to have the buy-in um, of all senators, not just the opposition senators, but to have a consultative process and input from as many partners as possible. Um, and so what we're going to see tomorrow is just the first reading of the Cannabis Control and Licensing Act. Um, so what it is basically is extracting what we had uh, produced in October of last year in the Misuse of Drugs Amendment and now creating a standalone act. So that is what will be presented um, tomorrow for first reading. Mm -hmm. Now, does it also mean that you would then have to remove cannabis from the Misuse of Drugs Act? No. So it will still be an offense, for instance, for, over 10 for if you do not have a license um, to cultivate cannabis, mm -hmm. if you do not have a license to be a dispensary, um, if you don't have any of those licenses, it is still an offense. Um, and what we're trying to prevent here, because we have to understand that cannabis um, has THC content, and mm -hmm. so we have to be responsible moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to ensure that those who are involved in the industry are in fact meeting certain standards. And you hear it all across the world, even in Jamaica, um, for the last few years, they've had their ups and downs with the industry because they're not hitting certain standards. Mm -hmm. um, I think you had a doctor on once mm -hmm. uh, from the CLA, the Cannabis Licensing Authority, saying exactly the same thing that our cannabis consultant is saying, that if you're going to be legalizing an industry, it cannot be that your product uh, has pesticides in it. Mm -hmm. It cannot be that your product has mold or rot. It cannot be that it is laced mm -hmm. with anything uh, like harsh chemicals that mm -hmm. are poisonous to your body. And so there are certain standards that have to be hit. Um, and that is what we're trying to do moving forward. And so even though our uh, cannabis legislation is unique in that it includes social equity licenses for the small man and the small farmer, mm -hmm. We have to ensure that those small farmers are trained 
to ensure that they are hitting the standards as well because we're not just producing cannabis for a local market. We have a lot of tourists that will be coming mm -hmm. to the country. Um, and imagine, for instance, um, <laughs> if you did not know what was in a bottle of rum and they yeah. just gave you a bottle of rum and you don't know what was in there if they laced it with anything else. Mm -hmm. And that's the importance. We need to know the quantity of THC in each particular package that you're buying. So as a responsible buyer, you might say, okay, that has 5% THC. I might be willing to try that, but I don't want to try the one that has 10% THC. And so giving consumers the option in a very safe and responsible manner, that is what we're trying to create with this particular what legislation. Is your perspective on the stigma surrounding cannabis and marijuana usage and the fact that you are at the helm of this entire movement to sort of bring an industry together and be able to have various stakeholders participate in this industry. I know that, for instance, growing up, you've heard people who are staunchly against uh, marijuana usage. You also have people who are very strong proponents of it, but there's a cloud, there's a stigma mm -hmm. that surrounds it all together. And now you are at the forefront. What's your take on that? Yeah, I think that Belize is a fairly conservative society, mm -hmm. but um, at the same time, we have to recognize that we do have a, a lot of users, and so mm -hmm. we cannot turn a blind eye to that. I would estimate, um, and others have estimated as well, that of our adult population, approximately 30% have used marijuana, consume mm -hmm. marijuana. Um, and so that's a very high number uh, when, you, when you think of it. Um, if it's 200,000 people, uh, adult population in Belize, we're talking 60,000 people use marijuana. And so um, we have to create a safe environment for them. Um, it cannot be that we have this illegal trade. Um, and that's a whole other topic for us to discuss, particularly when you look um, at Belize City under the microscope. All of these gang-related murders, they all stem from this very plant. And mm -hmm. so we have to find a way to include these young men in a very uh, responsible and safe system. So they have to be a part of the system in terms of dealing. But at the same time, we have to understand that is the root cause. Yes, mm -hmm. there may be a continuation in terms of retaliations. But when you look at it, all of the illegal drugs, again, we don't know what is in these drugs coming mm -hmm. across the border, but they also come along with illegal firearms. Mm -hmm. And that is something that we have to curtail. And again, that is something we're trying to fix. If we produce local marijuana, for these young men to sell, then they won't have to buy and dodge the police and come in illegally with this foreign marijuana, which we don't know what is in there. Let's, let's, let's set aside the crime and violence aspect just for the time sure. being. What I want to find out from you is, look, so we're creating an environment where marijuana or cannabis can be cultivated, wholesaled and retailed on the local market. But perhaps our climate, our conditions to be able to grow this particular strain of marijuana, for instance, may not necessarily be as conducive as perhaps somewhere in Mexico, where they could produce a strain of a higher quality. You will still have people trying to introduce the, the outside marijuana, so to speak. How, do you, how, how would you be able to address the idea of the homegrown versus the imported illegal stuff? I, I am convinced, um, Isani, and as well um, speaking to a number of um, consultants, not just mm -hmm. our cannabis consultant, but across the region, that uh, people feel more comfortable going into a dispensary mm -hmm. and going on the shelf and being able to select what, what again, what percent THC, mm -hmm. indica or sativa, they feel more comfortable in that setting than buying illegal brick weed, so mm -hmm. to speak, that comes in a saran wrap that mm -hmm. you don't know what is actually contained mm -hmm. therein. Mm -hmm. And so that by itself, the fact that you're going to be able to go into a dispensary that has packaging, that has labeling, mm -hmm. that has safety uh, recommendations, I think that's the kind of thing that's going to eliminate the illegal trade. Not completely. There will mm -hmm. always be an illegal uh, mm -hmm. trade, but at the same time, it will lessen, in my opinion, um, especially since the cost of cannabis will go down since it's going to be locally produced. Mm -hmm. It's like you're looking at 
local beer versus contraband, contraband yes. beer. Yes. It's, it's a similar scenario. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let, let me come back to it. So, uh, as you clearly pointed out, there's been a lot of work going into what direction Belize should go. And in all the conversations we've had so far, it doesn't seem that going what has been the tried and tested route of exporting or selling marijuana for the exclusive purpose of medicinal use. Has that been explored for Belize? Because we have seen where other countries have been able to successfully implement that. Um, I don't see that as the trend. I see the new trend as going recreational and going back to what Isane was saying. This has been such a, a stigmatized industry for so long that those in the industry realize that you cannot just go one day from having an illegal substance to one day, oh, this is totally legal and uh, you can purchase it across the counter. And so there has been this gradual movement towards recreational and one step mm -hmm. along the way to recreational cannabis has been medicinal because there are so, medi so many medicinal components yeah. to marijuana, to cannabis, that people are now realizing, especially with all the cannabinoids and CBD and the the, the health benefits coming from CBD. Um, but what, what we have to consider where we are along this chain. Mm -hmm. um, we are at a point now where 10 grams is legal mm -hmm. for you to have in your possession. You did not have to go to a doctor to get a prescription for that 10 grams. Mm -hmm. And so we actually jumped that hurdle in 2017, the medicinal hur uh, hurdle. And now it is legal for you to have recreational cannabis, mm -hmm. but you have a very potentially dangerous substance not knowing the content, not mm -hmm. knowing where it came from, and again, tied to an illegal, illicit trade on the streets of Belize yeah. City. Um, and so, while it is that, yes, some states are actually going medicinal first, those are the conservative states, it is expected that it's going to be federal very shortly, if not this year, next year in mm -hmm. the United States, and most states are going to be going recreational. So Belize is actually going in tandem with a lot of the United the states in the United States of America moving in this direction of recreational. Now, Minister, this has been a conversation that has been ongoing for quite a while. It almost feels like a, a, a party bag that you're showing the children, but you're not giving it to them. Yeah. What, what groundwork has actually been done? Well, we've been working a lot uh, in terms of looking at various legislations and trying to tailor, make one for Belize. Um, it cannot be that we have the exact same legislation as any other place in the world. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, we have a unique social equity component that other jurisdictions don't have. Mm -hmm. um, and that has been applauded by other countries in the world as well because they realize that the people who have been affected by this trade are the black and brown populations of the world and they have to be incorporated and so we see where there is resistance in other parts of the world um, mm -hmm. because they are trying to exclude them and mm -hmm. so we're saying no we have to make sure that those people are included because they're the ones who have faced the harsh penalties have mm -hmm. served time in jail uh, for this particular plant and it's 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 just crazy to think that um, and so um, th that is the direction that we're going. Yeah, so you're talking about uh, establishing things like the social equity license. Yes. Now, what about uh, whether or not it will include things like criminal records? Yes, so the expunging of... Expunged, yeah. What a lot of people don't realize is that in the 2017 legislation, mm -hmm. and I was just speaking to the commissioner last week about this, the 2017 legislation that decriminalized the possession of 10 grams of cannabis actually contained therein uh, a provision that if you have a possession record for cannabis, you can apply to the commissioner of police to have your record expunged. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people don't realize that. And so when meeting with the commissioner last week, I, I mentioned to him moving forward, um, can we get a list of everybody uh, who has a, a criminal record for possession and can we expunge those records without them having to come to you or to apply to you to get those automatic. records? It should be automatic. Um, he explained, of course, that under the old system, this is going all the way back to the 80s, those systems have not been updated to the more mm -hmm. digitized, computerized system that you can just type in possession and all the people come up. So it will be a very tedious uh, exercise, but a very important one, in my opinion, to ensure that everybody's record is expunged. It's interesting you'd say yeah. that um, 
two weeks ago, I was assisting a young man with getting his documents together to apply for a job. And part of that process was applying to the police department to get his criminal record. Now, this person is not a violent offender, so he doesn't have anything that reflects any kind of physical crime or what have you. When he was like 19 years old, this was many years ago, he was charged for possession. This is well over 20 years ago. Wow. Right? And so the, the record came up and it has charge for possession of the quantity of marijuana that he was found with. I'm saying all of that to say this, that even though we know that there has been this decriminalization process and the fact that, you know, you can apply to the commissioner to have that record expunged, when you take that document to your employer, even though it says the date and the fact that, you know, there's a new law in place and all of that, you're still faced with this very same issue of, of being singularized if i may like yes. you're being you know looked at as okay well you have a charge for marijuana possession and that perhaps is not favorable to sir, some employers how do you look at that situation in light of what we're saying that it should be automatic yes and that that's exactly the the conversation that i was having with the commissioner that if we are going to be moving in this direction yeah. mm -hmm. it cannot be that individuals who do not know that this law exists mm -hmm. that they are entitled to it and so it should be something automatic um, and then it, yeah, it that goes, could have been proactive that could, when they apply for the criminal record exactly so yeah. whenever uh, for, for example personnel at the department if they are producing that record and they do identify somebody is requesting a record but it mm -hmm. has possession I agree with you that should automatically yeah. be expunged mm -hmm. um, and so but but I fully agree with you that it is something that that like you said you are singularized and stigmatized mm -hmm. uh, because of those possession charges and you are treated as though you are a criminal yeah. uh, when in fact uh, history has shown that that cannabis is not as dangerous as alcohol abuse is not mm -hmm. as dangerous as smoking a cigarette that has the nicotine and has you know um, um, the tobacco in it um, and so that's something that we are, in my opinion, um, it is a slow process, but I think we are pivoting to realizing that mm -hmm. as, as a society. So let's, let's go back to some of the other groundwork that's being done. So these so social equity licenses are meant for persons who are already involved in the trade. Yes. Because what we've seen in other countries is when you do open up for licenses, it's foreigners and people who have the means mm -hmm. who will be the ones to invest first. And mm -hmm. they box out people who've pretty much grown up, mm -hmm. whether uh, growing or selling marijuana. Mm -hmm. We talked about the, the aspect of the criminal record, but then there's also things like being able to access capital. Yeah, that's going to be a huge um, obstacle moving forward because that is the one thing that has not advanced. So even though, like I said, in America, they are moving uh, slowly towards federal, mm -hmm. it has not taken place yet. Yeah. And so, the, as you know, Belize's banking system is mm -hmm. highly dependent on what happens in America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that could affect correspondent banking here. And so what we're looking at is to create some sort of a community bank within mm. the country that does not have any ties, any correspondent banking whatsoever with the United mm. States. Um, I think the National Bank would have been an ideal candidate for this. However, um, I, I was recently informed that they received correspondent banking yeah. because they didn't have it up until late last and year. And even a local bank will need to align with one of the larger banks. Exactly. And so um, if you do not create that community bank, then it will be like it is in the United States, a cash only system. Mm -hmm. And that's something we want to try to steer away away from. Um, but it, because it is of the a potential for crime. Uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely, um, which is why we have included in the um, legislation security licenses. That's going to be very and important. Other forms of money laundering, right? If you're if you're dealing in a cash owner system, I would presume then, that you could move money and legitimize absolutely, it. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the pitfalls of it. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I think that the the rate that we are going by putting in the framework now. It's not going to be for another couple months or even a year.
year before we actually get a cultivation or first harvest, so to speak. Mm -hmm. By the time everything comes around, I think we will be on par with where the United States is. Like I said, they're about to go federal. And if they do go federal, that will not affect our corresponding, that will remove that obstacle. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we have been doing is getting in line, getting in place this train that's moving so fast mm -hmm. to make sure that Belize has something to gain from it as well economically because we haven't spoken about that yeah. yes we could see where it will attack a lot of the social ills affecting us today especially with crime and violence but there's a huge economic opportunity that also lies ahead with this implementation of this industry i would well, assume me... sorry I, I would assume that there has to be what we would consider like a multi-sectoral dialogue in terms of this particular industry in the sense that Agriculture, the Ministry of Agriculture should have some input okay. in it. The Ministry of Economic Development should also have some input in, the, in that discussion. And of course, you're wearing two hats as the Minister of Home Affairs and of course, New Growth. What has that conversation been like in terms of trying to get that off the ground? You, you're perfectly right, Isani. And um, moving forward, that is exactly the direction that we're going with the commission. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people come to me asking, can I get a license? And my first response to them, I will not have any say in the determination of who gets mm -hmm. a license. It will be determined by a commission. Mm -hmm. And so that commission currently has nine members. And like you just pointed out, all of those individuals, all of those ministries will have a seat. So it's not the minister that's going to be on the seat they're going to appoint a representative to sit on there so you're going to have the ministry of health yes. which is very exactly, important yeah. the Absolutely. ministry of tourism because we don't want this to be something uh, like new york where everywhere you go you can smell marijuana mm -hmm. it has to be that we are a cannabis accessible country as opposed to just marijuana everywhere mm -hmm. so we have to be very responsible moving forward and that's why the ministry of tourism is an important important partner and stakeholder in this uh, the Ministry of uh, Economic Development will have a seat on, at the table. Um, a Ministry of Agriculture as well, um, as well as a Cannabis uh, Social Equity Coordinator. So mm -hmm. that somebody there looking out for the small man to ensure that he too yeah. can get a license in this uh, venture moving forward. So all of the important stakeholders and ministries will be represented at the table. So um, let's move forward with the dispensaries um, and explain to us a bit more what the thought process is uh, in who will be allowed to sell, where they'll be allowed to sell. I know it's very early, but clearly yeah, you have it, an idea. It is very early. And I think um, Belize City is a unique situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be very... Um, pragmatic moving forward in how we deal with Belize City and dispensaries in certain locations, um, especially, like you said, everybody that's currently involved to make sure that they are involved as well and receive uh, dispensary licenses moving forward from Belize City. But in larger destinations, like tourist destinations, we won't have as many dispensaries. So we might have one or two in San Pedro, one in Kikok, or one in Placencia. It cannot be everywhere. But the idea as well, moving forward, is that within uh, resorts, certain resorts may be pro-cannabis, and they may have a consumption lounge within their resort, mm -hmm. an area where you can go and have a smoke. Um, they may be allowed to sell. So they would have to purchase from the dispensary, but be able to sell from from their lobby so to mm -hmm. speak mm -hmm. in a certain area um, and so that is a, again another huge economic earner moving forward for the country because mm -hmm. like i said if 30 percent of belizean uh, adults are are consuming uh, cannabis you have to also understand that in america the same movement is happening and there may be even more than 30 percent uh, of users and when they come on vacation they may want to relax and want to be able to have go in a consumption lounge in a safe environment and consume uh, a, cannabis and how does the ministry of tourism feel about this especially if they market belize as a family destination yes and that is why moving forward it's very important um, i believe we have very good support from the ministry of tourism but again that's that's the discussion that we're having that we want to be a cannabis accessible nation we currently mm -hmm. are a cannabis accessible nation you know but you have to go on the street corner <laughs> but they break in the a law dark every time hole they buy. sorry they break they the break the law every time they buy and, and it's a, a very shady business and so you have people accosting the tourists mm -hmm. every day and so that is the kind of thing that we want to remove and to make it like i said a very safe and responsible way for you to purchase and access cannabis from an entertainment point of view I say entertainment in terms of like nightlife and that sort of stuff. 
will we see a rise in the number of hookah bars and other places where you can, you know, consume marijuana in a social setting? I believe so, and, and that is the intent and purpose of the consumption lounge license. Mm -hmm. um, there will also be restaurant licenses. Mm -hmm. A new phenom phenomenon that's growing is, are chefs that actually cook with yeah. cannabis. Mm -hmm. um, and so you'll have restaurant licenses, you'll have consumption lounge licenses. The idea, though, um, and the thinking is that you should not uh, have a consumption lounge license in a bar. Okay. And so you don't want to be mixing alcohol with cannabis. And so if mm -hmm. it is that you're just going to be providing cannabis, you can get a consumption lounge license, but mm -hmm. not offer alcohol at that location, only mm -hmm. cannabis. Mm -hmm. um, so there will be a, a growing number, not a lot. Like I said, you don't want it to be mm -hmm. so prevalent. And I'm sure the churches will insist that it's not so prevalent. Mm -hmm. um, so, so moving forward again, uh, a limit on those types of things. Now, let's, let's go back to the churches, because we know they were very uh, quick to, to stand up and say they weren't consulted the last time around. Um, what's been the consultation this time? We had a very good dialogue with the Council of Churches mm -hmm. um, prior to the launching of the first bill in, uh, in October of 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, a very fruitful discussion, um, very sober discussion. And they were insisting that, you know what, we don't want cannabis to be in the hands of our young people. Um, and I fully appreciate that. And they are, they are one of uh, the groups that said, you know what, maybe 18 is not the age because your brain is still developing. Mm -hmm. Let us move that age to 21. And so, again, that's another very good aspect of this act that we have to look at. That in order for you to have cannabis in your possession, you have mm -hmm. to have an ID card and you have to be 21 years or older. Uh, we mm -hmm. saw a very disturbing video um, of a young man just last week. We saw one with alcohol and we mm -hmm. saw one with cannabis. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's what we're trying to fix. We're trying to avoid that because that young man should not have cannabis in his possession. He has mm -hmm. to be 21 years or older so that we know that the brain can fully develop before you can access cannabis. And right now, that's not the law. We want to change that to make it more responsible. Well, that's an interesting point because I think that's, yeah, I've had conversations with people looking at uh, the very same point you made earlier where we have a serious problem with alcohol, excessive alcohol use in this country. And there's a lot of thought and stipulations being put in place for cannabis where clearly you, you mentioned um, the effects aren't as bad. Do you now take the opportunity to look at the legislation when it comes to alcohol to be able to address the weaknesses there and then the very tricky and challenging part of enforcement? Enforcement. Yes, that, that I think is the very difficult part, Marlene. Um, we see a lot of road traffic accidents that are mm -hmm. occurring because of alcohol abuse. Um, and I think that um, the Department of Transport is very mindful of that. The police department is mindful of that. I know that we recently approved an increase in the number of officers for the Department of Transport for that very reason, to be on our highways, to ensure that individuals are not driving while under the influence of alcohol. Um, and I, th I think that um, we all have a role to play moving forward. The media as well in terms of uh, education campaigns mm -hmm. on the abuse, not just of alcohol, but tobacco, of cannabis, of all these uh, different substances. I think that we, we all have to play a role moving forward in that educational campaign. Well, I mean, unfortunately, we don't have the detailed statistics that we should. Yeah. Um, but if you even go back and look at the murder statistics that we do have and some of the violent crimes and crimes of passion that we talk about, many of them, your commissioner would say, are most likely linked to, to alcohol abuse. So while we have all this conversation about stipulations put in place for, for cannabis, um, why not take the time to, to, look, at, to look at, at the that. enforcement for alcohol as well? Yeah, I don't know if anybody gets asked for an ID when they go it's to true. the store. It's true. Um, and if you and, and have I was just going to document it because it's an anomaly. <laughs> and I was just going to say um, that, that I, I have heard of instances, I haven't witnessed it myself, but young children going to the store to yes. buy alcohol and it's so easy for it them says, to, to purchase alcohol. It says alcohol won't be, one, consumed on the premises, two, sold to the persons under the age of 18. But that is only there for... 
what to say that they are complying with yeah. the law yeah. but in fact um like you're rightly pointing out it happens a lot and I, and mm. so as a community again um i know that in our particular neighborhood in king's park we have a very vibrant um neighborhood watch group if they know of instances where alcohol is being sold to minors they will report it um, and then that particular establishment would be sanctioned and their license would be taken away from the liquor licensing board and so we do have to look at that not just uh, from a police standpoint but from a community mm -hmm. standpoint that we all can play a role uh, in terms of uh, curtailing that very serious issue of making alcohol available to minors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. And so uh, what's your prediction in terms of the rollout from uh, this first reading to when we start to see the movement on the ground for the cannabis industry? Well, assuming that we, we do get the support um, from the Senate, um, which would be, I, I believe, second reading would be in two weeks, well, not two weeks, mm -hmm. in a week and a half, next mm -hmm. week, Thursday. If we do get that approval, um, the next step would be to form the commission that I spoke of that will determine licenses. That commission will then look at regulations. So again, input from all the stakeholders in terms of moving forward in a very responsible way from all our, our partners uh, coming up with regulations for the industry. That could take, uh, in my opinion, another month or two. Um, so that would take us somewhere around uh, June uh, for, for them to start deliberating and uh, considering applications for the various licenses moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, so again, a harvest would take maybe three months. It, it would be more towards the end of the year that we'd, we would have our first Belizean harvest of cannabis. Um, and then, of course, that would then have to be packaged with a manufacturing license and then put on the shelves on a dispensary. Of course, they will have, we will have to set up a cannabis monitoring unit. Mm -hmm. Now, that's going to be comprised of uh, a personnel from Baja, mm -hmm. personnel from the forensics department, and a member of the Belize Police Department. So they're going to be the enforcers in the industry to make sure that your product is safe to go on the shelf, to make sure it has a particular THC content that you're saying that it has to make sure it's not laced with anything make sure it doesn't have pesticides on it mm -hmm. all of these things moving forward would have to be put in place so mm -hmm. what we're discussing now is just the framework just the structure um, and i know you're probably thinking why don't we have all those things in place but <laughs> we, we can't until the legislation passes um, and then we can activate to get those things in place mm -hmm. all right so let's shift gears now and, and one of the conversations we must discuss is looking at the situation of crime and the recent uh, gang flare-up. Uh, let me just get your perspective. You've you've spoken with uh, some of the very active members in gangs directly. You have attempted to uh, convince them to convert their lifestyle, but yet we still struggle. Yeah, I think I said a while back, and I think the commissioner echoed my sentiments uh, when we had the truce, the mm -hmm. various truces across uh, Belize City with various groups l late last year. And that resulted in a calm for maybe two months. November and December were fairly calm. And I think I mentioned then that the only way a truce can really work is if these young men turn in their guns. Um, what we have right now is a very serious situation, a very critical situation. Like I said, a lot of it stemming from this very plant that we just discussed. Um, a lot of the guns and ammunition coming from the cartels in Mexico are coming along with the cannabis. And so... Uh, our borders, as you know, are very porous. Mm -hmm. And so the influx of guns, um, a lot of people are calling for an amnesty. But even with an amnesty, I can tell you, if you give up a gun today, two, three, four can come across the border the very wow. following day. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to take uh, these young men who are currently involved in the trade to realize that they are only killing out each other in many instances, uh, not for any serious reason. It's just a matter of retaliation. Um, so you killed my uncle, I'm gonna kill your dad, I'm gonna kill your mom, I'm gonna kill your friend. Um, and many times it's innocent people that are affected. Um, and so there are two approaches mm -hmm. um, that I believe we have to employ. One is that uh, we have to look at these young men to see how we can reform. I am mm -hmm. a firm believer in that and I will never stop believing in that. But at the same time, uh, once we give them that opportunity and they choose not to reform or they choose not to work along with us in a meaningful, productive way, um, and they choose instead 
to carry out retaliations, to carry out murders. That is when we have to employ the long arm of the law. Um, and a lot of people look at the police department and say, but just last week you were intervening or you were uh, mediating and now you're coming down heavy on us. <clears throat> In any other jurisdiction it's not the police department that does mediation or does interventions yeah. um, and so that is why we have called for this multi-sectoral approach we see now mr dawson we see the department of youth services intervening they're taking on that role um, but at the same time the job of the police department is to get the guns off the street and to prevent crime from happening prevent these murders from happening something struck me <clears throat> last week minister when I did several stories, the, the death of the young man, um, Carel Sanchez from Flamboyant Street, who got killed in that crossfire off Logwood Street, that was one. And the other was the raid on the Baptist residence um, on Thursday. What struck me is the fact that these are the very same individuals who are involved in the mediation process. We've seen pictures where they are part of the dialogue, the discussion with the leadership intervention unit. And <clears throat> in the middle of all of that, the commissioner made the point that these are men who, by day, give the impression that they're intent on reform, and by night, they are the ones, they are the very same ones who are going out attempting to execute each other. And in the middle of it is the police department trying to broker a, a peace or a, 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 a sort of a ceasefire between the two parties. That has to be a very tough situation for you to find yourself in as the minister it, it, it is a tough situation isane but i am comforted in the fact that we have a roadmap and a way forward mm -hmm. with the leadership intervention unit um, we only started that project last year in october getting the buy-in from government mm -hmm. and we do not have the necessary resources to carry out all our plans but we've only scratched the surface of what that plan really entails for instance uh, a lot of people don't know that currently we are training violence interrupters, 60 mm -hmm. of them. So Mr. Dawson by himself cannot solve crime mm -hmm. all on his own. He's not Superman as much as I respect him and I value <laughs> the incredible work that he yeah. does. It's not a one-man thing. And so he's not going to have a team, a team mm -hmm. coming from the community itself where these young men are. Law-abiding citizens who say, you know what, we have had enough of crime. We want to fix this. We want to work with these very same young men who are involved in crime. So you have teachers, you have principals who are taking this violence interrupter training who have a good relationship with these young men to guide them and so moving forward we're going to have all of these groups in the respective neighborhoods who are going to be working along with these young men like i said to make sure that they stay on the right path um I, I can tell you that while it is that we are counting the number of murders that happened in the last two or three weeks, mm -hmm. I can tell you the number of murders that have been prevented just by the interruption and, and intervention of these very same community activists and community members who are saying we're tired of the crime, we want better for our young men, and we're going to be a part of the solution as opposed to just complaining about it. And so that's a very reassuring uh, feeling for me as a minister to know that we're not in this alone. Yes, we have the police department and they go above and beyond in terms of what their responsibilities are. But at the same time, we now have a community movement uh, coming from the leadership intervention unit that I'm very, very comforted by moving forward. It's going to take some time. I always say that, um, but I, I do believe in the process and I do believe that there is going to be some dividends that we'll be seeing in the, in the months and years to come. Minister, help us understand, you know, uh, a few years ago when you were in opposition, you shared the perspective I think that the public does right now. Something has to be done, it has to be done now. Of course, now you have the benefit of all the internal information. What has shifted your perspective and what can help us understand why the situation is as bad as it is? Um, I, I think the situation is as bad as it is because of the drug trade, the illegal drug trade and the guns that have been coming into mm -hmm. the country. Um, in the last few years. Um, it's, it's now, I mean, the commissioner could tell you some neighborhoods have crocus bag fulls, full of guns. Imagine that, that our streets, it's so easy to access a firearm. Um, and that's why we're working with agencies like Crime Stoppers. They have a very active campaign right now yeah. in terms of trying to find the guns that are on our streets. Uh, and we need to also um, consider moving forward 
perhaps increasing the penalty for possession of an illegal firearm. Right now, it's three years in jail. Um, and as you know, a whole household will be rounded up mm. if a firearm or ammunition is found. But perhaps it is time to revisit that legislation to increase the number of years in terms mm -hmm. of a penalty because obviously these young men don't see it as a deterrent yeah. to but have an illegal it firearm. They hide it in an empty lot. Or they bury it. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is buried and so that makes the police work difficult um, but, but I have to take the opportunity uh, as we're raising it to commend the good work of the special patrol unit last week in taking a very violent uh, weapon off the streets, a Mach 10. I don't know mm -hmm. if you understand the level of, of mayhem and carnage that could result from a, such a deadly weapon on our streets. But it just goes to show that particular point that guns are so accessible and are everywhere on our streets. And we have to work with different agencies uh, in getting them off the streets. So again, I, I want to commend the police work uh, in getting the firearm, the Mac-10 off the streets, as well as the, mm -hmm. the firearm that was found, uh, I believe, in the neighboring yard of, of the Baptist last mm -hmm. week. Um, and one other thing that um, I want to echo the sentiments of uh, Miss Debbie Sewell, I, I heard her say it last week on Love FM, that how we approach situations is very important. So the police department is always the villain, always the bad guy. Mm -hmm. Police is always abusing us. But when you look at these videos, when a mm -hmm. police um, unit is entering a yard, they get insults, they get attacked, they get items thrown at them, they get people with guns in the yard. And so perhaps that's the reason everybody is reacting that way to police because they know maybe they're hiding a fugitive or mm -hmm. maybe they're hiding firearms and they have to react that way. Or they've had a bad experience. Or they had there. a bad experience. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to understand that the police is just trying to do their work. They're going to carry out searches. So you may want to resist a search on your premises, but it is illegal for you to resist a search on your premises, especially if they come in with intelligence that you do have weapons on your property. And so I want to echo the sentiments of Miss Ewell in saying that let's not re resist. Let us work along with the police department and then there will be no issues um, like these arising. Um, and, and so I want to request the, the compliance of, of members of the public whenever a police comes, just comply with their requests and everything will flow smoothly from there. But it goes right back to, and, and I know we haven't talked about it in a while, but it goes back to building that relationship with the community. Um, whether perceived or whether they've actually had a bad experience with the police, very often people feel that, that it is not a relationship where the police is there to help them. Yeah, like I said, um, the police has gotten a bad rap and in some instances, uh, justifiably so. We're not going to shy away from the fact that there are rogue cops or corrupt cops that are out there. Um, those officers, like I said, one by one, we're taking them out of the department. Um, just in the last year, we have taken out over a hundred officers from mm -hmm. the department. That's a lot. And I, and I think the most in, in any one year in the history of the police department. And that goes to rebuilding this type of uh, confidence and restoring this confidence with members of the public. And I think the media has an important role to play because I see a lot of social media Facebook sites that proclaim to be media, mm -hmm. that their sole objective is to attack the police department every single day. And so they're feeding into this narrative that police are bad and us gang members, we're not bad. Even though we're hiding fugitives and have firearms on our premises, we'll make the police the bad guy. And so the media has a very important role to play in correcting that narrative. And I think Channel 5 may have corrected a narrative just last week because there were items being thrown at the police department in a very hostile environment when they went um, on, on police street last week. Um, and so again, everybody has a role to play, including the media, in shaping the narrative moving forward and, and keeping police officers accountable um, to make sure, again, that we don't have these rogue elements or these corrupt elements within the department. I want to go back to, we, we had a conversation with the commissioner a few weeks back, and um, one of the things he said is that he's hoping that you can get another intake of yes. officers. While you speak of 100, about 100 officers being let go um, for bad behavior, essentially, there was also a loss of others' retirement and yes. those who just mm -hmm. left the force. Yes. So the force is smaller than what it, you it inherited, is, even it, with a new intake. It is. Um, the budget will be presented tomorrow. 
we know crime is a huge issue. Will we see that reflected? We are looking um, how we can utilize a recurrent budget. There is a budget in there for an intake, uh, a much smaller one. Last time it was 225 officers. We're looking to reach either 125 or 150 officers in this next intake. So there is that included in the, the upcoming budget. Um, and like you said, um, when you look back at 2016, the department was at 2,600 police officers. Mm -hmm. Currently, we're at 2,100 officers. And so even uh, when we speak of Plan Belize and saying we want to get to 4,000 police officers, we're still way behind. Yeah. Uh, we're still lagging behind and we're losing officers, like you just rightly pointed out. And so and another intake is important. Um, we have to look again at the economy, at what is available to us as a department. Um, but, but there is something in there for another intake this year. Uh, let, let me go back to an earlier question I asked, um, and I guess you can reflect on your time in opposition to remember what it feels like. The public is impatient to see the situation of crime get under control. How do you respond to that? Um, I think the, the public certainly, um, especially in Belize City, yes. feels that it's a very tense time. Um, we've seen crime, different forms of crime taking place all across the country. A lot of domestic violence mm -hmm. uh, crimes happening, a lot of crimes of opportunity, a lot of robberies. Um, and the public, like you said, realizes that we're living in a very difficult time. Um, gas prices are up, cost of living is up. Crime obviously stems from poverty. And so all of these things are interconnected. Um, but moving forward, I think the public is, is aware that despite all of that, the police department is trying its best. Um, they have made their presence known in Belize City in the last few weeks. We've brought in um, the operational units from all across the country to descend on Belize City. And so there's a very deliberate move right now as it relates to the gang crimes in Belize City. That will have to, we'll have to find a way to continue that. And it can only continue with more intake of officers to have that greater presence of police on the ground while at the same time implementing our roadmap or strategies for reform. Mm -hmm. Because like I've said before, we went from four gangs in the country of Belize in the 1980s to now 28 gangs in 2022. We have to break that cycle. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't break that cycle and go, go and target the young, young men to make sure that they're not recruited, to make sure that they have free education and they have opportunities, uh, educational and employment after education, that's the way we solve crime. Um, and so that's, again, something that's going to take a while because we're trying to break the cycle is really what we're trying to do to make sure they're not 30, 40, 50 gangs the next 20 years from now. So that's going to be uh, obviously a long-term plan, but at the same time, we have our immediate actions that the LIU is taking, um, as well as the police department. Let, let me get a, a, your input here on one more issue. Well, a two more, really. Um, one is looking, as you pointed out, the situation of cost of living and fuel tax. I'm sure you've heard it from your constituents, we understand when there's a lack of resources, how it can cause a spike in crime. Uh, what's your thought on, on the situation with the fuel tax and the raising um, cost of gas? Well, it's not necessarily the fuel tax, so to speak. And I think that that is a conversation that we now need to start having. It is really based on the cost per barrel of, of oil, the acquisition costs. Um, when we look at 2020, the cost per barrel of oil was $40. And now the cost per barrel on the world market is a hundred and ten dollars. So forty and a hundred and ten dollars in twenty twenty two is a huge difference. More than doubled. Um, yes, and so we're we're not the only ones in the world facing this crisis. Um, everywhere in the world, I think in California, it is almost six dollars a yes. gallon, which is twelve billion mm -hmm. dollars. So we see it reflected in other parts of the world as well. But at the same time, um, I, I think we need to be more responsible in terms of our use use of the roads, in terms of use of our vehicles. Um, we need to carpool more with our friends and colleagues to get to work. I think we just have to move a lot more smartly given, given the current um, um, cost of fuel that we're facing. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the political front, the opposition is in a leadership convention. Any thoughts on that one? Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, I, I don't want to opine on it, but just at the same time to 
extend my condolences to the Honorable Tracy Taker Panton. I can't imagine what she must be going yeah. through having lost her husband just last week and has to now face a leadership convention. Um, one would expect, one would have expected that we would have seen an, a delay or an extension in time uh, for her to at least grieve. I think that's important for her uh, yeah. because this is, this is, you know, a lot to take on. You have to travel the country um, and to, to go up against an, another um, party colleague. So um, that's something that I would have wanted to see as an outsider. But, but other than that, I, I don't have any opinions moving forward as to who I think will win the convention. All right. Any closing thoughts? No, I just I want to thank you very much uh, for having me on. And of course, uh, to reassure the members of our public, our Belizean public, um, that the police department is doing all that it can uh, with the very limited resources to curb crime in our country, crime and violence uh, in our country. And um, yes, it's, it's something that definitely keeps us up at night. But at the same time, we have to, to keep on it because it's something that, again, uh, while we inherited it, we can make no excuses, but we have to include as many partners as possible. All right. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you, too. All right. We're going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we'll be highlighting a Belizean doctor making strides in the United States. We'll tell you more about Dr. Kyla Kushner when we come back.